This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Come join us as we go to worship and give God our highest praise. Wherever you are, just lift your hands and worship with us. It's all right there in the living room, in the bedroom. Glory to your name, God.
Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Williams. And as always, I greet you with Jesus joy. Well, happy worship time, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. We're just glad to join you in our time of worship. And we're glad that you tuned in. And we pray to God that this word that we're about to share with you is a word that is going to bless your spirit, bless your home, bless your finances, bless every area of your life. So get your Bible, uh, get your friends together if you're with them and family together. And y'all sit down and listen to what the spirit has to say to us. God bless you. I'll see you after the worship. If you're not, <clears throat> if you're not disabled or holding a small child, would you stand, join hands with those around you now as we prepare with prayer for the word of God after we will have prayed. Would you remain on your feet for the reading of God's word? Let us pray. Indeed, oh God, you are mighty. You are worthy of praise. There is none like you in all of the universe we magnify you god and make you big in this place now god as we prepare for the preaching moment we confess today that we can do nothing until you come bless your people make fallow the ground of the souls of your people that the seed of truth might find depth that a relationship might be established between some soul and the Savior. Then, Lord, help me, your preacher. Breathe on my words and make them thine. Rescue me from me. Fill me and empty me at your will. Love me and do whatever you want with me. Hide me behind Calvary's cross. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only the shadow of the cross can be seen beneath. Take your glory, but Master, please give us the blessings we pray. We ask it all in the name of the pre-existent, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and soon coming King's name we pray. All the people of God said together, Amen. Amen. Come on, give him another hand of praise. He's worthy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Turning your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 10. We've been doing a series on prayer entitled, Let Us Pray. And at this point in the series, we have settled into the substance of the Lord's Prayer. And we've dealt with the structure of the prayer and the substance in the prayer as it relates to the structure of the first half of the prayer being three petitions that have to do with the glory of God and the second half, three petitions having to do with the, our own needs, the needs of humanity. Uh, when last we were together, I dealt with the first petition in the first half about God's glory, hallowed be thy name. What I want to do today is I want to kind of marry the next two petitions, the second and the third petition, which have to do with the glory of God as well, is found in verse 10. I want to marry them together because they are related together in a unique way that will hopefully become clearer as the preaching begins. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, if you found it, say amen. In the New International Version of the Greek text, for you to turn there, you'll find these words, your kingdom come, your will, somebody say your will, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you from this thought, your will be done. Your will be done. I want you to help me with that, but I want you to do it. If you're not embarrassed to pray in front of the people around you, I want you to look up to heaven right quick and, and say to God, Lord, your will be done. Amen. Now, 
I want you to do it again. This time I want you to do it not because I said it, but because you mean it. Look up to God and say, Lord, your will be done. If you mean it, give God praise if you meant that. Amen. Your will be done. Amen. Your will be done. You'll notice in the passage of scripture that we read, it begins, your kingdom come, your will be done. What is true about this concept of the kingdom or the reality of the kingdom is that it's central to the Christian faith. We sing about it, preach about it, teach about it. There's literature written about it. And this kingdom business is not only central to the Christian faith, but it is and was central to the preaching ministry of our Lord. In fact, even before the Lord began his ministry, you Bible students recall that John the Baptist, the Elijah-like figure, comes on the scene as a consequence of the fulfillment of prophecy, and he comes preaching to prepare the hearts of the people for the coming of the Messiah. And what he preached was these words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when John was arrested and his head cut off, Jesus came right behind him in his ministry in Galilee, preaching the same thing. Repent, change your mind, because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, if this issue of the kingdom is central to the ministry and preaching of the master, it do us well to figure out what the kingdom is. What did Jesus mean when he talked about the kingdom? Paradoxically enough, when Jesus talked about the kingdom, he talks about it in a way that lets us know that when it comes to the coming of the kingdom, it is best described as already but not yet. The people to whom Jesus was preaching was waiting for the coming of the kingdom, but their understanding of the kingdom was not the same as the Savior's. They thought it had only to do with Israel and that it would come quickly and that God would come liberate Israel and Israel would rule over other nations. But God had something different in mind. It would not come simply for Israel, but would come for the whole world, not something local geographically, but spiritually in the hearts of people. It would not come immediately, it would become gradually. So they expected the kingdom to come, and Jesus stood in the midst of some Pharisees and said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. But then he calls on us to pray that God's kingdom would come, which means when he says the kingdom of God is in your midst, he's talking about the present. But when he calls us to pray thy kingdom come, he's talking about the future. So in a real sense, when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about a phenomenon that is already here, but not yet here. It has come in its reality, but it has not come in its fulfillment. It has come, but it has not culminated. It is in our midst, but it is still on its way. In a unique way, eternity has broke through into time, and the reign of God has already begun. Every kingdom has a king, and that king is Christ. And every king has a kingdom, and every kingdom has citizens. And the citizens in the kingdom are those who have committed themselves to the king and trust the king enough to surrender to the will of the king. Now, when Jesus teaches about the kingdom, and the Bible teaches about the kingdom, not only does he teach that it's already but not yet. But when we consider this concept of the kingdom in Jesus' teaching, very rarely, if ever, does Jesus say the kingdom of God is. But instead, Jesus would say the kingdom of God is like. And then he would begin to speak in figurative or parabolic or comparative language. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed put in the ground that grows into a great big bush within which many different birds gather. Or the kingdom of God is a sower who goes forth to sow. Or the kingdom of God is like a net that is cast into the water and brings out of it fish of every kind. Or the kingdom of God is like 
a man who finds a treasure in a field and values the treasure so much that he sells everything that he has to buy the field so that he could have the treasure. Or the kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price, a pearl so valuable that nothing else matches its value. Now, Jesus would talk like that to his disciples, and unfortunately, his disciples were so spiritually dull that at times when Jesus was trying to give them insight into the nature of the kingdom with these teachings, they would look at him much like you looking at me right now. So what does it mean, this kingdom business? If we're going to pray that the kingdom come, then what is the kingdom to start with? Well, there's a phenomenon or something in the Bible called parallelism. Parallelism is simply the way Scripture is structured at times. It's difficult, for example, to read the book of Psalms without running into parallelism all over the place. Parallelism is simply when its text states something and then states it again. But usually when it states it again, it states it or says it differently than it said it the second, first time. And when it says it again, it said it, saying it not simply to repeat it, but when it repeats it, it almost gives you insight into what it meant to say the first time it was stated. For example, the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, he's a very present help in the time of trouble. Or here's something you know. The Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean? It means I shall not want. Or since the Lord is my shepherd, he supplies all of my needs. You see the parallelism? He states it one way and then you get even greater clarity when he states it again. Well, I believe that this is probably true with the two petitions that we see in the text. When we read the text, after we read the first petition that we pray, hallowed be thy name or that your name be reverenced in all of the earth. Hallowed be thy name. Then we pray thy kingdom come, which means we're praying to God for the coming of his kingdom. But what is his kingdom? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me say it again. Thy kingdom come. Well, what is the nature of thy kingdom? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you understand the parallelism in the text, then you understand that the kingdom of God, listen, is anywhere where the will of God is perfectly done. So when you pray that the kingdom come, you're praying that in the world, God's will will be perfectly done just like it's perfectly done in heaven. And that is why the kingdom is already but not yet. Because while God's will is being done in places in the world, it is not being done everywhere in the world. And since the kingdom is not simply some geographical location, then when it means doing the will of God, it means in the hearts of every human being. And so it's already here because there are some who have surrendered and seek to do the will of God, but it is not yet because there are still others who have not yet been recruited to be saved by the Savior, be citizens of the kingdom, and commit themselves to living out the will of God. And so when we pray, Jesus says, pray this prayer, your kingdom come, Lord, your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. Now, the way God's kingdom is going to be done on earth is that God's going to get involved in the process of bringing his kingdom on earth. But God's kingdom is also going to be done on earth because his kingdom, his will will be done in the lives of those who follow him. And so bringing the kingdom into the world is not simply praying for it, but participating in it. That means then that we are, listen, laborers together with God. We are in a collaborative effort with the creator, creature creator, dust divinity, us and God. We are partners together and together we work to bring in what God has inaugurated through the coming of his son, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
you and I get to participate with God in bringing in the kingdom. Now watch, remember the kingdom is everywhere the will of God is perfectly done. The interesting and paradoxical thing about our King Jesus is not only is he, listen, the king of the kingdom, but when he was here on earth, he is the perfect example of one who perfectly did the will of God. Which means if you want a role model for how to be a kingdom citizen, look at Jesus. Because no one did the will of God more perfectly than Jesus did. Listen to what the Bible says. He was tempted at all points as we are. The only difference is he didn't sin. So you can't say you don't know what I've gone through. No, he's been tempted in every major way you have, but he, when tempted, did not give in. In fact, when you read the Bible, you'll discover that Jesus' greatest desire was to do the will of God. In fact, it's not even strong enough to say desire. He had more than an, an itch to do God's will, inclination to do, or a proclivity to do God's will. It was his hunger Watch, it was what Jesus lived for. He had this deep hunger. Watch, he wanted to do God's will more than he wanted to do anything else. The one hunger that took priority over every other hunger he had was to do the will of God. He wanted to satisfy that hunger more than he wanted to satisfy his physical hunger with food or his ego hunger with being accepted by people, or any hunger for fame or fortune or prestige or power. Jesus' hunger to do God's will was greater than any other hunger he had, which means that if there was ever a time in his life when any other hunger conflicted with his hunger to do God's will, he would rather do God's will than satisfy any other hunger. And listen, when you find somebody who wants to do God's will more than anything else, you found somebody who is pleasing to God and dangerous to the devil. That's why the devil does not want you to ever get to the place where you want to do God's will more than you want to do anything else. Because when you want to do God's will more than you want to do anything else, then it's hard for the devil to get you to do anything else whenever it conflicts with the will of God. Let me prove it to you. You don't believe me. Let me prove to you that Jesus' hunger was for the will of God was greater than any other hunger. You remember when Jesus was walking with the disciples and they were about to go around Samaria, he said, no, uh, we must needs, I must needs go through Samaria. I got to go. Uh, God wants me to go. And so he goes to Samaria, you remember, and he sends the disciples into town to get something to eat, and he stops at a well in Sychar in Samaria. While he's at the well, you know the story, a woman comes to the well to get water. By the time she finishes her interchange and exchange with Jesus, she done dropped her water pots, ran into town, and said, come see a man who told me all about myself. Is this not the Christ? Meanwhile, somebody said, meanwhile. Just want to see if you was awake. Meanwhile, the disciples have come back from town with food. Remember, he sent them to get food to eat. They come back and they say to Jesus, eat. And Jesus said, I'm not hungry. Now, what do you mean you're not hungry? He said, I've already eaten. He said, well, eaten? How have you already eaten? Somebody come out here and give you some food? You know, Jesus is always talking up here and disciples are often thinking down here. And so Jesus had to go ahead and break it down for him and said, listen, I ain't talking about physical food. He said, my, listen, he said, my meat is to do the will of God. Oh, you missed it. He's saying, listen, uh, since I have been satisfied at the deepest level of my greatest hunger, I ain't hungry for nothing else. I'm so deeply satisfied that God's will has just been done. I don't even want no food. Come on, I don't want nothing else. Because there's nothing else that compares to doing God's will. And you can be free. You can be liberated. You can walk in victory and in power when nothing else matters as much as doing the will of God. Am I right about it? 
You wouldn't be worrying about it here trying to please people if, if you were more concerned about doing the will of God. Come on, talk to me. People couldn't push your so-called buttons if you were more concerned about doing the will of God. People, come on, you wouldn't answer at 3 a.m. when they call if doing God's, y'all can act holy if you want to, doing God's will was greater than any other hunger you may have. And the other hungers you may have may be legitimate hunger. Hunger for bread is legitimate. Hunger for sex is, is legitimate. Hunger for acceptance is legitimate. But never let them get before your hunger to do God's will. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So, uh, if in fact we're called to pray that his will be done, and we are in part called to do his will, if we're going to be committed to doing the will of God, that there's several things we need to know and then I'll leave you alone. Y'all ready for this? Wake up and write this down. The first thing I want you to notice is if you want to do the will of God, if you're going to be committed to doing the will of God, then you have to courageously accept the fact that we live in a world full of sorrow and hardship. Yeah. It's not an easy world to live in. And you need to understand, because of the nature of the world we live in, if you commit yourself to doing the will of God, there are going to be times when doing the will of God will not bring comfortable consequences. There are going to be times when doing right is not going to bring right, it's going to bring wrong. When being obedient is not going to bring pleasure, it's going to bring pain. When doing the will of God is not going to feel like a blessing, it's going to feel like bruises and brokenness. Yeah. It's going to be tough sometimes. But you got to be like Jesus. You got to want it so bad that even if you're tempted to do otherwise, in the final analysis, you say like Jesus said or pray like Jesus prayed in the garden. Nevertheless, not what I want, my will, but what you want your will. Listen, he's standing in the shadow of the cross. He knows he's about to experience the most excruciating and humiliating ordeal of his young life. He's about to be whipped until his ribcage shows. He's about to carry a cross up the Via Della Rosa. about to be nailed on a cross, hung up and stripped naked in public display. He's about to take on the sins of the world and his father is for the first time about to turn his back on him so that he could become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. They take his holy body, put him in a borrowed tomb. I'm talking about an innocent man, and he struggled. His flesh quivered against the idea that that would happen to him. And so he said, prayed the same prayer three times. Father, if there's any other way to do this, you got my vote. Let this cup pass from me. Three times, same prayer. Let me say parenthetically, whenever people tell you that you should never pray the same prayer more than once, and if you do, that means you don't have faith, the devil is a lie. If Jesus could pray the same prayer three times, then you are allowed to pray the same prayer three times. Because sometimes you don't pray the same prayer because you lack faith. Sometimes you pray the same prayer either because you want clarity or because you need some strength. You pray in that same prayer because you know what you ought to do. But you pray in that same prayer so that your life will line up with what you know you ought to do. And Jesus said, let it pass from me because all things are possible to you. But in the final analysis, Lord, it ain't about what I want. It's not my will because doing my will does not always get you glory. So if doing my will is going to rob you of glory, don't do my will. Let your will be. Are you willing to say to God, if doing your will is going to give you glory, I'll do your will no matter what it costs. So you got to learn how to resign to his will. But when you, listen, when you surrender to his will, you can't simply do the act of Jesus without the same attitude as Jesus. Because it is possible to say, not my will, but thy will be done and resign, but do it with a kind of resignation of despair and hopelessness to play the victim and say, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll do your will. You could do it that way. Or you can... Surrender, but do it with anger and bitterness toward God. 
I'll do it, but I don't like it. So the whole time you surrendering, you shaking your fist at God because you have to experience something. I'm going to do it because I don't have no other choice. You could do it that way. Or you could do it with the spirit that Jesus did it with because Jesus always surrendered to the will of God, his Father, with wisdom, with trust and love. He always did it trusting in his Father and convinced of his Father's love. And the reason why he could do it trusting in his Father, watch this, is first of all because he knew that God is a God of wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. And so you can surrender to the will of God even in the midst of perplexing and puzzling and painful situations if you know that God is too wise to make a mistake. That God has wisdom. That God knows what God is doing. That it doesn't make sense to you, but it makes sense to God. And that while you're trying to figure it out, he's working it out. Okay, let me say it like this. I, 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 like most of you all, I own a car. I don't know much about cars, <laughs> but I own one. The only thing to, really to me that matters about a car in the final analysis is when I turn the key, it will start. And when I put it in D, it will drive. I'm hard on cars. I have to get other people to help me take it when it gets messed up. When the car gets jacked up or messed up, I'll take it to a, a certain place to get it fixed. And sometimes when I take it to get it fixed, they'll start talking to me about what they need to do with all of this technical jargon. And I'll listen. <laughs> I mean, I know how to change the oil. You know, I know where that is. And I know where the transmission fluid goes. That's, I don't know where the wheels are. <laughs> but they start talking about all this stuff they got to do. I just get to the point where I say, well, look, you're the expert. You the one that knows what you're doing. So my car is broken, but I'm going to leave it with you. Because I know when I come back and get it, the car I gave you would not be the car you gave me back. Come here for a minute. Did you not know that if you know that God knows what he's doing, that you can take the situation that looks painful and puzzling and confusing, but you know what you're doing is the will of God, you can say to God, God, I don't know. You the expert. So I'm going to give this situation to you. Is there anybody in here who knows that no matter how puzzling, painful, or broken it might be, if you give it to him, when he gets finished, it won't be the same way it was when you gave it to him. Somebody say wisdom. <laughs> I like God for that. Not only is a God of wisdom, he's a God of love. Jesus could surrender even in the face of painful predicaments because he knew God was a God of love that God loved him and God loves you too oh yeah God is crazy about you more than you can imagine God loves you and whatever God does or allows is always for loving reasons and whenever you begin to doubt the love of God Paul reminds us of the extent of his love by saying if he would not withhold his only son but would offer him up to die for you then why are you confused about whether he's loving you right now he says uh, uh won't he give you all things which means that you may be going through something that doesn't seem very nice may not be very comfortable may, may not seem like God loves you he says but whenever that cloud of doubt begins to fog your mental skies remember that if God would let his only perfect son die for you while you were still out there doing everything you thought you was big enough to do then you should never ever doubt no matter whatever happens in your life whether God loves you or not he always loves you in every situation. And if he lets it happen or causes it to happen, it's always for loving purposes. So in the midst of that, you can always say, that will be done. So the first thing you need to know is you need to know that if you're going to do God's will, you've got to do it courageously, knowing that we live in a world full of hardship and full of sorrow. Secondly, you've got to know if you're going to do the will of God, you've got to know 
that if you're going to successfully do the will of God, then you're going to have to be in the habit as you go of praying to God so that God could show you what his will is. If you really want to know what his will is, you need to pray so that God will give you the capacity to discern what his will is. Because you know, as smart as you are with all the degrees you got, as all the experience you got, you don't know everything. And there are times when we are at a fork in the road of personal decision making and we don't always know which way to go. We don't always know what God desires, what his design is. His will is not always clear. But it is good to know that if you want to know, you can know if you go to the one who already knows. You can talk to him about it. And the wonderful thing about God is that God has provided these ways in which we can discover his will. Now, this is only important to you if you're interested in doing his will. If you're not interested in doing his will, I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to people who are interested in doing the will of God. Anybody interested in doing his will? Okay, all right. Wait, he, 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 this, this is going to help you then. God is so committed to you finding out what his will is that the first thing he did is he not only saved you, but he gave you the gift of his Holy Spirit. The very life of God courses through the spiritual bloodstream of your soul. God lives in you. And one of the many and myriad ministries of the Holy Spirit is to lead you into all ways of truth. The one thing that the Spirit of God does is the Spirit of God never leads you anywhere except the way God wants you to go. If you go any way, you grieve the Spirit. If you go any other way, then the Spirit is leading you. Now, I know why some of y'all can't shout right now, because it's not always easy to discern who's leading you. Is it self or the Spirit? Is it his desires or yours? Is it heaven or your hormones? Let me encourage your heart. Let me encourage you. You see, before you got saved, you lived according to the flesh. I think, I feel my opinion is, whatever your passions were, they led you. When you got saved, you were given something that's designed to lead you in a different way. Because the Bible says the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. Can I teach you a little bit? Uh, and when you were in the world, you were good at living according to the flesh. Now that you're born again, you've got to learn how to live a way differently than the way you used to live. You used to follow the flesh. Now you've got to learn how to follow the spirit. But the way to learn how to do it is you've got to practice doing it. Because whatever you practice, you're trying to get good at. So it ain't going to happen overnight. But listen, the more you say yes, the easier it'll be to say yes. The songwriter has said, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some others to win. When you get good at walking according to the Spirit, then it becomes clearer when the Spirit is guiding you rather than something else. God is so committed to you doing His will. Not only has He given you the Spirit, but He's given you the Word. God has reserved, conserved the Bible throughout the centuries so that you can have a manual on how to live. And the combination of the spirit and the word is a powerful and combustible combination of you discerning the will of God. If you try to read the Bible without the help of God, it ain't going to make much sense because the carnal does not understand spiritual things. But the one thing that the spirit does is not only lead you, but the spirit illuminates to you the meaning of the words and the application of it in your life. Aren't you glad that God has given you the word? In fact, it is the word and the spirit that created all that there is. If you read Genesis, and he uses those same powers to guide and provide for you while you're on your personal pilgrimage. So if you read the word of God and ask God to help you understand it, the spirit will kick in. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And he'll reveal to you his eternal truth and his will. But watch this. God has not only given you the spirit and the word, but God has given us people in our lives to help us. In fact, more specifically, God has, number one, given the body of Christ people with specific gifts that are designed to help teach you how to live according to the will of God. 
Yeah, there are teachers, people who have the gift of teaching in the body, and that gift is for the body. In fact, that's exactly what's happening right now. My gift to teach is what I'm using for you, and this is designed to help you discern what the will of God is. So I wonder if you can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Preach, Pastor Williams. So God has put teachers in the body designed to help God you watch. But not only has he put teachers in the body, God will put seasoned saints in your life. When I say seasoned saints, I don't necessarily mean a saint or believer who happens to be old. Because every old saint ain't a wise saint. I'm trying to help you. Uh, yeah, the, the world is full of both young fools and old fools. Preach, Pastor. What I'm suggesting when I say a seasoned saint is I'm talking about someone who's had a little mileage with God, who's got a history with God, who's been walking with God a while and has been a good student while they were walking with God. It's, that's the kind of person who's been where you are, has gone past it and is looking back on it. And so if you want to know how to deal with it, you need to talk to someone who's dealt with it and dealt with it the way God wants it dealt with. So you need to find some counsel from some godly person. That's why you got to be careful <laughs> who you invite in your circle of influence. You know the problem with some people, they always want to be the smartest person in the room. But listen, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You better invite somebody in your room that knows more than you do. Preach, pastor. The Bible says there is safety in the multitude of counsel, which means that when you get counsel from people who are godly people, you are increasing the possibility of making the right decision. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands where sinner stands, or sit where sinner sits, Psalms 1. So if, if the man is blessed if he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, that means he is blessed if he walks in the counsel of the godly. So you need to find some godly, you know, you need somebody that's a little bit more spiritual than you are. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> because if you're always around people who weak where you weak, then when you give in to your weakness, then they're going to give you an excuse for giving in because they got the same weakness you got. Somebody say godly. Yeah, so you need somebody you can talk to about these decisions you're making. So God puts people in your life. Not only does he guide you by people and Holy Spirit the Bible, but he, he guides you through circumstances. What I love about God is he didn't save you and then say, now go out there and do the best you can. No, he has not saved you and then left you to fend for yourself. God loves you so much that he gets involved in your life. Aren't you glad about that? God, by his providential hand, will orchestrate circumstances and situations in your life to help you make the right decision and go in the right direction. And one of the ways that God does that is when you're going in the wrong direction, he loves you so much that he'll slam a door right in your face. Can I get a witness? God loves you so much that sometimes he'll guide you not by slamming a door, but by opening a door. God says, this is the way I want you to go. And he'll open the door and say, go that way. And then you'll feel so good because you said, this feels like God's direction. But sometimes when you are going the wrong way and sincerely seeking after him, he'll slam the door right in your face because he loves you too much for you to go in the right direction. So he's going to make it hard for you to go in the wrong direction. He's going to slam that door. No, that is not the way to go. Now, the problem with some of us is when he slams the door, there's some people in here right now, you still standing at that door fussing and cussing and complaining and crying and upset because God won't let you have what's on the other side of that doggone door. But God has shut the door in your face so you could quit looking in that direction because he has the open door in another direction. 
That's what happened. That's what happened to Samuel. Samuel had anointed Saul to be king, but Saul fell out of favor with God, and Samuel was grieving over the loss. He kept on looking at Saul, kept on crying over Saul, kept on weeping over Saul, kept on grieving over Saul, and God got tired of it. He said, man, stop crying about Saul. He is not my choice. I got another choice. His name is David. And you are about to miss your David crying over Saul. You about to miss your future crying over your past. I wish I could preach this like I feel it. Shut doors don't mean God's mad at you. Shut doors mean that God has something better for you. For every Saul, I felt that when I said it, for every Saul, there's a David. And if you ever find David, you will forget all about Saul. <laughs> I, must, I wish I could stay there, but I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to come back and preach that right there. That felt, felt like the will of God right there. Yeah, God has ever, he ever done that for you? Has God ever blessed you so that you forgot about what you was crying for? And you know, sometimes God will orchestrate circumstances and situations and God will do it. Watch, and you won't know it was God until it's done. Uh, it, it reminds me of the prophet. You remember the prophet who said, Lord, I want to see your glory. He said, man, you can't handle what you're asking for. He said, but I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. He said, and I'm going to walk towards you. He said, but while I'm coming to you, I'm going to put my hands over your eyes. Because you can't handle seeing me coming in the fullness of my glory. He said, but when I get past you, I'm going to put down my hand and you can see my hinder parts. Y'all missed it. He said, you can see my back. Y'all still missing it. He said, you can't see me coming, but when I leave, you'll know it was me. And have you ever been confronted with something and you couldn't see that it was God and you were tore up from the floor, but after God got finished and was passing by, you said, my God, that was nobody. If God had shown you when he was coming, you couldn't handle it and you'd have run in the other direction. So he put his hand over your face. Oh my God. Preach, Holy Ghost. I feel like shouting already. He uses circumstances. So, so God has a lot invested in your guidance. God, God is really committed to your guidance. He, he has given you all these resources for guidance. And so you ought to at least pray that God will. God, let me, you all got time for one more? I got just one more. You, you not only, if you're going to live according to the will of God, you not only must approach the world courageously accepting that there is hardship and sorrow, you must not only approach the world praying to God that he would help you discern his will. Listen, but if you're going to really live according to the will of God, You've got to come to living in this world with a spirit of battle and service. Battle, soldier, service, servant. Yeah. What I'm suggesting to you is this. If you're going to be committed to living the will of God in this world, then you have to understand that living out God's will in this world is not done on a playground, but on a battlefield. The moment you said yes to Jesus, you declared war on the devil. And let me let you in on the news flash. Not only did you declare war on the devil and darkness and evil, but the devil has declared war on you. And his job description is not that long. If you look at his job description, there's three things in it. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the Bible says. He has come to steal, kill anything God wants to accomplish in your life 
or with your life or through your life. The devil wants to undermine it by stealing it, killing or destroying. Stealing your joy. Come on. Killing your marriage. Come on. God, he, wants to, he wants to destroy your influence. He wants to kill your reputation. He wants to mess up everything that God wants to do in your life. He wants to steal it, kill it, or absolutely destroy it. He can't keep you from going to heaven, but he wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything that God wants done in your life. So he, the devil is not playing. He's planning while you at sleep at night. He is committed to your demise. But can I encourage you? The devil may be committed to your demise. But if you know who you are, then you need to walk with a certain kind of spiritual swagger. You, 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 you don't need to be afraid of the devil. You need to get up in the morning and put the right clothes on. Put, put on the girl of truth and the blessed prayer of righteousness and feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is a two-edged sword, cutting and going, and a shield of faith where which you can quench the fiery darts of the devil. And tell the devil, give it your best shot. Come on, tell the devil you can roar and scream and scheme all you want to, but you have messed around and let me find out that you have already been defeated. So I may have to fight this fight, but the fight is fixed. I already know how it's going to turn out. I am more than a conqueror. I may not have a husband or a wife, but I'm more than a conqueror. I may not have a job. I may be unemployed, but I'm more than a conqueror. I may be sick, but I'm still a conqueror. Preach, Holy Ghost. I've already won. Can I tell you the point at which you can always win? Here it is. The Bible says faith is the victory. It, listen, it doesn't say faith, not that verse. It doesn't say faith brings the victory. Although faith is the master key that unlocks the door to the unlimited power of an omnipotent God. But the text doesn't say faith brings the victory. Not that verse. It says faith is the victory. Do you understand the power of of that text, faith is. Are you getting that? That lets you know where the victory is won, when it is won. Faith is, not when stuff changes. The moment you know that you know that you know that you know, the moment you have faith that is done, it is at that moment that you have already won. Because it doesn't matter what armor you have, if you think you're defeated, you already are. But if you know you've already won, even though you may be bleeding, even though you get knocked down, you get back up again because you say it ain't over till you're defeated. So, so, so you got to come into the world with a kind of spirit of battle. And the reason why you got to come into the spirit of battle, not only for you personally, but we live in a world full of darkness. We live in a world full of disease. We live in a world full of oppression. We live in a world full of uh, people exploiting others. And whenever the devil and his cousins raise their ugly heads, not only are we to fight the battle that has to do with our own personal lives, but we must fight the devil at every quarter in our society that is not consistent with the will of God. I wish I had some help in here. God is tired of milk toth mealy mouth, spineless Christians who just want to come to church and get their praise on, get their spiritual fix, and go back into the world and hide out till the next Sunday. No, no. How is justice going to be done if saints are too scared to fight for justice? How are the voiceless going to be heard if saints are too scared to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves? How how can the devil and darkness and evil and bigotry and hatred be challenged until there's some saints who stand up toe to toe and eyeball to eyeball to the devil and tell the devil you are a liar. 
Look at your neighbor and say, don't be scared. I got to hurry up. I got to cut across the field. So you got to, you got to have a warrior's heart. But watch, not only must you have a spirit of battle, but you must have a spirit of service. Because there are people in the world who are broken, incarcerated, bewildered, befuddled. There are people who are isolated and alone. And they need somebody who won't simply send God in prayer to the hospitals, to the prisons, to the naked, to the homeless. But will meet God at the prison. Come on, at the hospital. Come on, under the bridge. You're not saying nothing where the naked are, where the homeless are, where the oppressed and depressed are. We need a spirit of service. And listen, when you have a spirit of service, if you're going to live according to the will of God, then you've got to have a spirit of service. Because the position of service and servant is the highest office in the kingdom. Talk to me, somebody. If you really want God to be pleased with your life, don't count how many people serve you. Consider how many people you serve. Come on, we got to get out of here. I'm out of time. If you've been blessed, give God some praise. Come on, stand on your feet. We got to go. We hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message, and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If you want to be saved and have new life in Jesus Christ, pray this prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you, for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen, and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Well, did that word blow your mind or not? I hope and pray that it bless your spirit and bless your entire household. We do not have the words to express how excited we are to be able to bring you this broadcast. We're able to do it because of the faithful support, financial support of our members, Base Memorial Baptist Church, wonderful congregation, and the friends of Base Memorial Baptist Church, people who may not be members yet, but they love the ministry and they love what we're doing in the community and in the world. If you you want to join in supporting this ministry if it's been a blessing to you then there are a number of ways that you can give we try to make it as convenient as possible it should be right there on your screen uh, you can give by cash app dollar sign base memorial and the money will get here you can give text to give that's the information on there as well you can also go on our website basememorial.com and go on the giving tab click it and follow the brief uh, instructions uh, if you'd like to you could drive by just come by the church and drop it off. Your tithes, offering, and sacrificial giving will make sure that the money gets where it's supposed to go. If none of those are appealing to you and you'd rather give by snail mail, that's fine too. Just send it to Base Memorial, 620, that's 620 
Zero East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203, and we'll be glad to take it and use it for kingdom work. God bless you. Again, we're excited to be able to come to you in worship. Now, we love to end with a word of prayer and the benediction, so let's pray together. Father, we are grateful to you for everything that you do in our lives. You are better than we deserve, and we're so grateful for your mercy, your grace, and your love. Teach us, God, how to love others with your love and to show grace and mercy to others as well and to live in such a way that others are blessed, we are blessed, but you ultimately get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace and give thee peace to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Love you. I'll see you next time.